everybody, it's Romania Black, and we are on episode 16 of Revolutionary Girl Utena. Did I say it right? <laughs> I keep getting so many comments. People are like, bitch, say it right. And I was like, look, pronunciation, I am not, I've had people ask if I'm neurodivergent. I don't think that I am, but there is one aspect of my brain that always struggles, and that's pronunciation. It took me with Toilet Bound Hanukkah Kuhn, it took me like 12 episodes to get that name right. So this feels about accurate, but yeah, I struggle with pronunciation. Even if I tell my brain over and over and over again to say something correctly, sometimes when it's time to say it, it just is like, nope, not today. So, Utena, Utena, we're gonna try our best. <laughs> I'm not going to make guarantees, but I'm going to try my hardest to get that right. So hopefully those of you are like, oh, thank God. <laughs> it won't have to be the next 30 episodes of her saying it wrong. But we're on episode 16 of Revolutionary Girl Utena, and I have a lot of comments to get to before we start this and one piece of fan art from the Discord I want to talk about. So we might as well just dive right in, won't we? So um pancake over in the discord many weeks ago um because i'm recording ahead shared this piece of fan art which is from tumblr and it basically was like um talking about this pin and it shows uh utena pulling the sword from anthe and there's like all the white roses underneath which is really cool because the white rose on utena's uh jacket whenever she duels um and all that but i you know sometimes when you see words within words they had in this what caught my eye was that in the revolutionize in revolutionize there's the evolve sign like evolve right and you're like okay well the evolution of you flip it around and it's love so you know subverting expectations about romance and about things like that and then all the songs whenever they do the apocalypse song it's all about evolution so definitely seemed to make sense and fit for this piece of fan art but i just wanted to point that out so we have a lot of comments to get through, so let's just go ahead and dive in. Um, Lyndon, as well as uh, Zanette Show, as well as um, Oliver Jajado, all three of them pointed out in episode 11, talking about how episode 11 focused on Anthe's kind of, or Utena's status quo with Anthe before the whole incident with Kiryu Toga happened. Um, and then basically the Shadow Girls, which we'll talk about in a second, they talked about how the dueling system is just getting repeated over and over again around that point without being questioned which now in the current storyline is something for Utena to deal with. You know, is she going to start asking questions? She kind of is with Akio in the last episode. Um, and is she going to take her and Anthe's friendship for granted again? Like she got Anthe back, but now there's this layer with Akio and the brother and all this that it's, it's going to bring it all back into focus. And it's like, you've been through this once with Toga, Utena, so now what are we going to do? So I thought that was interesting to point out. Um, Savvy Bros or Savvy Brunos, sorry, Savvy Brunos pointed out that Utena is definitely taking the prince persona back in episode 11 a little too literally without letting Anthe make her own decisions and save herself, which ties to Anthe's current situation. You know, is she okay with all of this? Is she okay with what Akio is doing? And that ties to the very beginning of the series where Savvy Brunos pointed out, you know, regarding acting like a prince, is this really a good idea? And I thought that was really interesting because when I first started the series, I thought that, is this really okay? Or is that a good thing? I thought it was the idea of, oh, subverting genders is bad. And it's like, no, that's not really what it, they're asking. They're like, is putting on this persona and not letting people have their own agency really okay, even if you mean well by it? And I'm like, ah, okay. So by episode 11, we kind of have that tied a little bit better into question. But that is a good question. Is Utena gonna let... Anthe save herself, or is Anthe even able to do that? Does Anthe want that? That These are all important questions. I also liked how it connected to H Banana 7's comment about while Utena's whole main objective is, you know, F the patriarchy, she also subscribes to the concept of it in the sense of the prince and princess hero and damsel social structure, which I thought was great to point out. She wants Anthe to be free, but free under her own agenda up until the end of episode 11. So it's like, you want friends? Of course you do. And maybe in order to revolutionize the world, this is H Banana's words, maybe in, in order to revolutionize the world, both girls just got to get on horseback as knights. <laughs> so maybe Anthony needs to become her own prince persona and save herself and be strong in that regard. I don't know. I, I want to know how they both get to the whole knights on horseback invading the castle scenario. I'm excited for when we get to that point, but we're not, we're not there yet. 
So Oliver Jajado has their commentary from episode 11, which we're catching up with, but I want to go ahead and talk real quick about um, Lucy Althusi. <laughs> Uh, 7172 they posted this comment back in episode six but whenever anybody posts comments on any of the episodes i usually will have my moderator check it and i'll go back and read them so just know if people do go back and, and comment i am looking at those it's never too late to comment on an episode of revolutionary girl utena but um but they posted a very long comment and it was mainly talking about the uh takaka Takarazuka review from back in episode six. And I want to read what they posted because I think it does tie a bit into the series now, which we're going to talk about. So they said the, the, talk, the Takarazuka review was an all women female group established in Japan in 1913, about a year after the end of the Meiji period. The intention of the group was to capitalize on the popularity of adaptations, translations, and the import of musical theater shows from Western countries. The group became popularly known for a style of Western-inspired romantic musical theater in which the all-women cast play both the roles of men and women. This dramatic aesthetic and style was extremely influential in Japanese popular media in general and anime and manga specifically, most obviously in shoujo, in no small part due to the review's popularity with girls and women who were becoming an increasingly important economic demographic during this period. It's so interesting because, yeah, 1913, women's suffrage was in 1922 in the U.S. where they gained the right to vote. It's like the, the 20th century really became a time for women to be like, oh, yeah, so about those rights. <laughs> and so, you know, and, to, and back up, not that women didn't have rights historically in the past, but there was a long period of time where the patriarchy was a major influence in culture and women did not have rights. So I think it's very interesting. So naturally, as they go on to say, a popular theater group putting on shows increasingly aimed towards a female audience in which women could have been seen as having dramatic romances on stage with other women attracted a sizable number of queer women and performers. This was not the intention of the owners or producers, but there was a ton of rumors and cultural anxieties about the sexuality of the fans and performers because this was also a period of increasing stratification of gender roles and criminalization of homosexuality as a direct result of the influence of Western ideas about gender and sexuality. And the comment goes into more detail about this. Look, I if you've ever studied ancient rhetoric and you've studied Sappho's texts, people, LGBTQ... A plus the labels may be more modern but the people involved in those communities have been around since the BC eras so they we people have always been there it's just a matter of if those voices are recorded and detailed in the annals of history but to say that it's a modern thing is not but I thought it was really interesting and they go into more detail in the comment about it but say regardless these anxieties regarding the potential queerness of their audience and performers, not to mention a highly publicized double suicide of two performers who were in a romantic relationship, led to policies that were strict in the review regarding interactions between the performers themselves and the performers and other fans. And the comment goes into more detail about this, but I'm hoping there's not a, Rome a Romeo and Juliet scenario with Anthea and Utena. Let's hope that's not the case. <laughs> Interviews with former performers have detailed how the majority of the cast were queer women and their romantic and sexual relationships with one another were basically an open secret. The stereotype even became a joke about Ray in an episode of Sailor Moon, where the other girls find a Takarazuka review memorabilia in her room and tease her about it, basically low-key calling her a lesbian without actually coming out and saying it. And I remember that episode now because I was a huge Sailor Moon fan growing up. And as a kid, I didn't understand the joke. I didn't get it. I remember watching the episode and then making fun of something in her room. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. And now it's like, oh, okay. But I mean, case in point, any time that you have media representing characters that can be viewed as representative of a group of people, that group of people is probably going to sign up to want to play those characters because it's a chance for them to experience that that persona on stage. So, so basically, as they summarize, the important distinction is between the conservative owners and the general cultural landscape and the very queer space constructed both within and against that conservatism among the performers and fans. And this historical complexity and struggle definitely seems to be something that Ikuhara is invoking both here aesthetically and thematically. Yeah, and that's a big part of Utena is just the idea of the series basically calling into question 
all of these thematic elements. So I thought that was really good. So thank you for thank you for putting that comment down. And then finally, Oliver Jajado has the comment saying, um, uh, first of all, I need to apologize because as Oliver Jajado points out, um, the tells was just referring in episode 11 to the father and son duo for the William Tell story and the shadow girls were just telling it. So, um, oops. <laughs> So I've been calling them the Tells the last like five episodes and no, they're the Shadow Girls. I They were just, but by the Tells, they were talking about William Tell and his son. So um, just ignore me on that one. <laughs> but the Tells all also a cultural figure. So it's fine. Anyway, the commentary for episode 11. I tried to live true to myself. You're just like an alien, someone said to me one day. They must have been telling me you're not normal. In other words, apparently living true to yourself means living as an alien. And so I became an alien all alone in this world. There's a certain natural law that goes to gain something, you must lose something. There's nobody in this world who gains everything. Otherwise, there would be people who could live forever. That is something she is blind to. That's why she loses what's important to her. Why did she want to become a prince? Who was it who wanted to become a princess? Do you want to be chosen by someone too? Or, and that's the commentary. So, Utena tried to be true to herself, but she gave up being this crying princess to become a prince that could be stronger than that. But in by being a prince, she ignored the agency of Anthe the princess, who was all alone as well. So Utena was blind to that with Anthe. Did Utena want someone to be her prince even while she was strong? Which is her whole dilemma with Toga. Or did she want to be chosen? Or what? So how does that tie, in my opinion, to Soji and Mamiya, whose name I keep forgetting last episode, Mamiya in wanting to be chosen? Lots of things to think about. And I've talked for 12 minutes about this preview, but I really, really appreciate everything y'all are talking about in this episode. And in the comments, there's so much food for thought. And there are things that I miss, like with the whole William Tell thing and, and the thing with just... There's so much that this show is drawing off of, and that's kind of what I love about it. So I love when people in the comments are like, here's something else, too, that adds another layer to it. And I'm like, ah, it's so great. It's so great. But with that being said, we're not going to waste any more time. We are going to dive right into episode 16. I did not watch the preview, so I'm like, all right. Um, and we're going to start that here in three, two, one, and let's... Ago. I, I had to go get a drink before starting this. Okay. <laughs> so what this definitely tells me is that next week things are going to go down. Because last time we had a bonkers episode involving Nanami, shit got real the following week. And that was back in episodes 8 and episode 9. So I'm like, okay... We had this episode. So episode 17 is going to pick right back up and be crazy. So, which to me, we've had Mickey and we've had, we've had Mickey and we've had um, the fiance of Akio. So the only student council members left are Nanami, which things happened to Nanami this episode, but she wasn't used as part of the Black Rose. Um, and then Jury. So I, I would predict that it would be, I don't think we'll do Nanami back to back, especially after we had just an episode on her. I don't think they're going to bring Sionji out of the woodwork. So I feel like Jury would be the one they would focus on next week if I were to guess. But how they're going to go and do all that, I have no clue. If they're going to target the guy or the girl that she thought liked the guy, I, or if Jury's going to be the one targeted, I don't know. It, it, I don't know if they'll keep trying to do the same thing they did with Mickey because they realized that didn't work, or if they're going to keep trying new ways, new ways to get energy for the Negaverse. <laughs> Just, you know, if they're going to do like Queen Barrel and just keep going through multiple rounds of trying to get things accomplished, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. But let's talk about this episode. <laughs> I feel going into this, like I'm, I'm a little bit of a source of knowledge about some things and why I was like, wait, what? 
<laughs> because uh, I grew up on a farm. My family have raised cattle for like 30 years. Um, now, granted, we raised beef cattle and the cows in this episode are the very stereotypical cows. That everybody, when they think of a cow, they think, oh, black and white spots. Those are Holsteins and they are dairy cattle. They are raised for their milk production. And that is their main prime purpose. You don't eat Holstein cows. They have dairy cows and they have beef cows. And if you eat beef, you are eating beef cattle. And there are lots and lots and lots of species of that. In Japan, it's primarily Wagyu. Wagyu are the, the main breed of beef cattle in Japan and they're really really nice cuts of meat it's extremely expensive in the U.S. to get Wagyu because of importing it um they're marbling like the fat versus muscle ratio in the meat is really good with Wagyu so they're usually like considered more delicacies um, my family raises Herefords from Herefordshire um England and Herefords Herefords are really good cattle too to eat they have the, there's a lot of her her certified Hereford beef in the U.S. that's sold as well usually people in the U.S. think of Angus cattle for like beef they're like the black hided cattle Herefords are red with the white faces they're the prettiest sorry about it <laughs> but um, which is funny because I have a red and white shirt on. Um, but yeah, I, usually in Japan, Wagyu are the known beef species or the primary one that are raised there. Holsteins are dairy cattle and you don't eat those. You can have dairy steers, don't get me wrong. Steers are, are eaten, but it takes a long time to fatten them out. And I would argue the cuts of meat are not great. I don't know. I just have decades of experience with the beef industry. So I know a little bit about these things and I'm like, ah, but anyway, we'll talk about it in the episode. What interests me that I didn't notice before is going back to start out the whole, the intro story with Utena and her parents dying and all this. And they have the roses on the tombstones, which, you know, I feel like it's all connected. That's my conspiracy theory tinfoil hat. So we'll just see how it all ends up being connected in the end. But one thing I noticed is that it starts out with the red roses around the border. The red roses getting to the prince showing up, right? And we've seen the red roses tied to Kiryu. We've seen the red roses tied to Akio. We've seen that all tied together. And now they're tied to Utena in this opening scene. And then the prince shows up with his red cape and everything and talks to her about, you know, he gives her the ring. We still don't know how that worked. And then when we see the him walking away, the roses are white. So I was like, okay, so is the roses being white tied to the prince? And then you mix white and red together and you get pink like Utena and the pink roses surround Utena. So I don't know if her being a princess and then him being a prince coming together and then having that conversation and she's combined that prince and princess persona to become Utena and it's pink instead of red and white together. I don't know if there's a reason for that or a meaning behind it, but it seems like there might be. So that's interesting. We'll just have to wait and see how that goes. But I thought that was neat. So this episode's called The Cowbell of Happiness. Okay, so in in the mansion, I think it's interesting that the, the dorm that... Um, Anthe and Utena live in is very viewable from where uh, Akio lives. So that is not lost on me that maybe he keeps Anthe there so she's within sight of him. Also the idea that he's in this giant tower that's like a watchtower where he can see it's like the, um, is it the Panepticon where he can see everything. That is not lost on me as well. So this is what it is. It says, next up, we have a pendant from the now renowned designer brand, Sebastian Dior. And they're like, look at this elegant shimmer. Oh. So she was watching this QV. So this is Anthe's fault. She was watching this QVC episode, ordered this pendant from Sebastian Dior. Uh-huh. But wait, I also love that she is... um. I was making it in the reaction a joke to Death Note because there's an episode of Death Note where Light Yagami is eating out of the chip bag. And it's like, you know, and I eat this potato chip. And Anthe, connecting Anthe to Death Note is the funniest damn thing. But also that tiny little TV screen. It's so tiny. Girl, you're going to need, no wonder you have to wear glasses. Your eyesight's going to be ruined by that tiny little television screen. Also good to note that Utena can sleep through um, the TV being on. So that's great. And they're like, this orders are open for this luxury designer brand, Sebastian Dior pendant. She's like, oh, it's cute. So, okay. So she ordered the pendant, but it said it was from Sebastian Dior. So I'm guessing the QVC show just gave her a knockoff that was a cowbell. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting indeed. So the best part about this whole episode 
is the fact that Nanami threw a gigantic party for everyone to come and watch her get this designer pendant to wear. She threw this big party, invited Mickey and Jury. They both showed up as student council reps. None of them checked on Toga. None of them saw if he was alive or not. We, I, I thought that we'd get like a shot of them going up to the room and like opening the door and being like, are you okay, former president? And he'd be like, Duh. and it's like, he reminds me of Cameron Fry from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where it's like, when Kiryu was in Egypt town, let my people go. <laughs> like, you know, it just, it reminded me of, Cameron and Ferris Bueller's day off where he's just sitting there dying and Ferris Bueller calls him and says, you're not dying. You just can't think of anything better to do. <laughs> and so I need that with Toga. I need that. I need someone to edit that, that, that video, that sound clip from Ferris Bueller over the shot of Toga in the chair being like, come on, Toga, you, you're not dying. You just can't think of anything better to do right now. <laughs> That's what I thought they were going to do. They were going to go check on him, and he was just going to be still in ennui. And no, they just completely ignore him, which is hilarious to me. So funny to me. Although, I had been really hoping that Nanami would have taken this opportunity this episode. It seemed like she was getting over him and moving on and being like, well, fine, brother, I'll become my own person and do my own thing. But that's not entirely true. She still wants... Obviously, he's her brother. She still wants to be connected to him. Can you blame her? Girl, her outfits, I would I would love Nanami's outfits. I would, Nanami Kiryu, I would love her wardrobe. Yellow's not my color. It washes me out, so I don't like the yellow base on the dress. But that, that like, kind of turquoise, like, almost teal top with all the frills and the bows. Girl, and the gold jewelry with the matching like jewel tones. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Like she's so fashionable. I love everything that she wears. And they're like, what a gorgeous dress. And she's like, oh, it's for my dear uncle. And like, you're always the best dresser. And she's like, oh, this nothing special. <laughs> like if I could pull off a blonde wig, I would cosplay as Nanami in an instant. But then who shows up to who shows up to the dinner party? Mickey's in his little blue tuxedo, which kind of has the blue jacket that looks like what Kozu wore in the last episode. Just saying. And then Jury. Jury showing up. The the purple pants, the white shirt, the jewelry. Girl came to upstage. She just showed up like, mm. What I love about Jury so much is she's so unapologetic in in not only her fashion, but who she is. She's like accepting. She's like, oh, Oh, this is me. You got a problem with it? Like, mm-hmm. She reminds me of, in Romy and Michelle's high school reunion, the one girl in the mean girl group that when they have the reunion, she shows up and she's like this accomplished news anchor and fashion designer. And she's like, actually, they have great fashion. I'd say it's not that bad. Like, she just reminds me of that. Like, she's so self-assured of herself, which is great. But she shows up and is wearing, like, designer jewelry. And, of course, Jury's like, oh, well, I was a model, so. <laughs> and Nanami's biggest... Nanami's biggest weakness is that she is jealous and that she gets jealous and possessive. Well, now she has nobody to get possessive over because Kiryu's out of the picture, but she still gets jealous and wants to be the center of attention. So they bring over this, like, Caffian Dior. Oh, my God. And they're like, that emblem, it's Sebastian Dior, purveyor of the British royal family, the most elite designer brand. And she's like, the most elite designer brand. She's like, yes. And she was going to show off this other pendant that matched her dress but instead she opened up and it was a cowbell inside and everybody and no one has the gall or the gumption to inform her that it's a cowbell right nobody has nobody has the um the ability to to point it out to her even though she probably knows that it looks hideous, but she's too proud to let that go. So she's going to wear this cowbell regardless and just pretend like nobody's bothered. And it's like, oh my God, not me. Oh my God. But I think it's hilarious. So I, fashionable cowbells to be sure. Also, not me has an entire herd of cows. <laughs> not me has a herd of cows. Not me has an entire agriculture farm at this high school. She also is allowed to buy Sebastian Dior shaped cowbells. How bougie is your family, Anthe? <laughs> Hilarious. Hilarious to me. So yeah, she just keeps going about her business. And I, I love these episodes in particular because Mickey and Utena work together. I love when they have episodes where the two of them kind of bond over trying to help Nanami out. 
Um, also the gag where Anthony has been knitting the red sweater that's uses the bull riders cape and, and finally comes together in the last act. That part was really funny. And I liked that. That joke worked really well. I liked that the teacher and everyone else, everyone's afraid of calling Nan Nanami out because they don't want to make her mad or make her feel bad. Also, the tennis outfits that they all wear in this show, the tennis outfits with the mint green skirts and like the rose and everything on there, super cute. I don't know about this whole, um, I felt bad, but like the gym outfit that she's wearing where she has the cow print shirt. I kind of want that as like a pajama shirt. I would like totally wear that. I was like, oh, that's actually really cute. So she's like, everyone's taking notice of my immaculate fashion sense. Uh, you know what though? I absolutely love that Suabuki, Suabuki's a real one. He's the only one other than Utena that goes out of their way to tell her like, hey, that's kind of weird. You probably shouldn't wear that. Like Suabuki, what a trooper. He was actually trying to tell her and be honest. And it's like, hey, I don't want to make you feel bad, but um, you should probably take that off. It's kind of like when you have like you've ate broccoli or something and you've got something in your teeth and you go all day long with something in your teeth and you're like, hey, and that one friend comes up and they're like, hey, you got something in your teeth. And you're like, I've been, I've been, I've been having this all day long and nobody said anything. And they're like, yeah. So the person that tells you, you got something in your teeth, they're a real one. They're a friend. They actually told you and had the nerve to do it rather than just letting it go. I was like, that's right. And poor Subuki, he's like, he's like, I don't understand. And of course the three guys from episode six, who are just nodding their heads in agreement. The three guys that like, you know, Huey, Dewey, and Louie that are trying to get on Nanami's good side, um, they're just following a herd mentality as it would be, right? There are so many metaphors that fit this episode involving cows. There's herd mentality, there's being bullish, you know, grabbing, grabbing things by the horns. You know, there, there's a lot of different metaphors and sayings that could apply to this episode. And the idea of her being stubborn and being a bull, I wouldn't be surprised if she's a Taurus. Honestly, if Nanami was a Taurus, I would not be surprised. So the only other thing that's truly relevant from these conversations is the fact of Utena getting upset at Nanami saying, like, calling me a she-he, like, calling me what? Like, like, you don't get to say that. And to be fair, you know, you should probably not assume something about oneself, Nanami, or about someone else, you know, without, that could be offensive, without talking about them first. Also, Choo Choo getting stuck in the milk jug is actually really cute. And she's like, don't compare me and my clothes to your cowbell. I do love when Utena knocks the one guy out and they carry him off on a stretcher with the with the siren and the lights. That part was hilarious. But yeah, Nanami just ignores them all. And then, then we have this weird ass dream. The dream where she becomes a cow. And basically, the point of the dream is that Kiryu... He basically fattens her up and sends her off on the little cart and then it ends up eating her. So he basically, you could say it's a metaphor for him using her and being completely complicit in the idea of sacrificing her and not caring about her. And the, that dream is showing that she's afraid that Toga doesn't care about her and that it's a one-sided affection. That's a very real problem and concern for her to have, right? But the song, the imagery of the shadow of the cow with her on the hay bale and him feeding her the hay, oh my God, is, is really well done. But then, okay, the song that they sing is really disturbing because it's about someone taking a cow off to a marketplace to, to be sold, to be killed. But then when they were talking about carrying a calf within, meaning that the cow is pregnant, I was like, show. I, I was starting to get the impression the show might have her turn into a cow. And I was like, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> they wouldn't go a teen wolf route by doing that, would they? But then when they were singing the song about carrying a calf within, I was like, they're not going to have like, like, like Nanami. Like, they're not going to have that happen. Right. They're, they're not going to have that happen. <laughs> All right. Because that would be weird. That would be like, that, that would be getting into AO3. Like you go into a dark region of AO3. I'm not saying I've been there, but I, that's getting into some areas. That I'm like, wait a minute, what? And it looks on with mournful eyes. Basically saying that as you take this cow off to go get slaughtered, you don't realize that the cow is carrying another life within it. And it's like, oh, shouldn't you feel bad that you're killing this cow and killing the calf too, right? You're killing, which if we're going to get all metaphorical, it's like, oh, you're basically 
taking using Nanami as a scapegoat for your own means, Toga, and slaughtering her without realizing you're killing the innocence within her. You're killing the child within her in doing so, right? And if that's what that song means, then I get the metaphor. I do get it. I want to make note, though, just in case if you're wondering, I would say 99% of the beef, at least in the U.S., maybe in Japan it's different. Maybe in Japan it's different. But I would say 99% of the beef that Americans eat, for example, one, come from beef cows, not dairy cows. Dairy cows are a milk industry, so it's a whole different thing. Um, but two, 99% of them are not female. The whole point of keeping female cows is that they have calves so you can sell them. So you don't want to sell the female cows. So instead, I would say 99% of the beef you eat are steers, which are male cows, male cattle that have been castrated. So usually the process of that is that you you purchase, we sell bull calves off when they're, when they're like weaned. And then, cause we don't really, we keep maybe one steer back for our own freezer. We keep like one and the rest we sell, but you sell them as bull calves or you steer them and sell them as steers. People steer them because you don't want testosterone in the meat because testosterone makes the meat very like rough and gamey and doesn't taste good. So you'll cut that off, cut the testosterone, and then you basically fatten them out and then you just eat. So basically most of the beef you eat are castrated male calves, not females. Now, baby calves or veal, I don't eat veal personally because I don't ascribe to that. So that's just my personal thing. But um, usually that's the case. Now, occasionally there's a cow that's like 20 years old and they might make hamburger out of her, sadly, but usually it's it's male cattle. Also, the whole thing with the nose ring, most of the time nose rings are only in bulls because it's to help bulls, you know, have attitudes sometimes. So it's for you to like, you can grip on. nose. A, a cow's nose is very sensitive. So if you put a nose ring in there and you tug on it, that cow will stop what it's doing and be like, okay, no, never mind. Um, we've only had nose rings in our bulls before because they can get attitudes. And if you want to move them from one pasture to the other, you need that to help move them around. Um, but whenever we have a nose ring put in, our vet will come over and basically put some lidocaine in there. So like if you've had your like, if you've had dental work done or like when I've had my mole taken out, they put lidocaine around there so you don't feel anything. And it's the same with the bull. They don't feel you putting the nose ring in because you put lidocaine there and it just get in. They don't know it's there. So, but yeah, anyway, <laughs> that's your farm 101 for the week. But God, that whole segment of Toga eating a steak made out of Nanami is just the craziest thing ever. <laughs> so then, yeah, I do like Nanami's room, her little pink. Her room is surprisingly minimalist and surprisingly not as frilly as I thought it would be. Like, she has, like, a wardrobe and the, the vanity, but her bed and everything, it's surprisingly not as uh, posh as I took it for. But she even slept in the bell. So, yeah. And then her starting to do all things like a cow, like the rumination hygiene, like with the, the four stomachs, because cows have four stomachs. So, and they, they ruminate. So that's why when they say chewing cud, like a cow will like get, like spit grass back up to chew it to like, it's part of the digestive process. It's a whole thing. Um, but then her following along, like if you've ever seen a cow in a field, they all like walk in a straight line and it's for efficiency. So they can eat all the grass and everything and they, they minimalize the damage that they do. So... But yeah, and then her eating and everything and all this. And poor, poor Suaboki trying to like yeah. help her out. But then, yeah, it was crazy. This whole like transformation into a cow. What the fudge? Also seeing Suaboki um, in this reminded me that we still don't know who the person stalking Nanami was originally. We never really found an answer to that question. I don't think it was Suaboki, so who knows? But yeah, and then her like in front of the full moon eating grass, like, terrifying and so then the shadow girls show up and basically talk about the idea of reaping what you sow being like you set this up so if you set up this idea of getting people to like like you and then you didn't want them you basically her pride pride goeth before the fall we just made it an episode where she literally becomes a cow <laughs> and it looks like we're like in the swiss alps for this scene Oh my god, I like that they made it a duel somehow. Ridiculous. And then she just becomes a cow. I guess that's why she has to wear the dueling costume, is for her to, like, become a cow with the dueling costume. 
And then they just made that silly song. I'm like, what the fudge? It was such a weird episode. It was so weird. I'm like, well, maybe that means, maybe that just means that we won't have <laughs> Nanami becoming one of the Black Roses duelists. Maybe not. We do go back to Jury, and Jury's like, well, how pitiable that she says the final days of someone enslaved to brands as she like reveals all of her jewelry that's sparkling. <laughs> ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Maybe that was a way for them to get Jerry back into. Now Jerry has a ring on her hand in that one scene and it's, it looks like, but it, is it part of her? What is it? I want to see her hand. It looks like she still had the regular duelist ring on. She did. Yeah. But there's a black ring right beside it. So who knows? Maybe this is a way to set up Jerry getting the black ring. I don't know. We'll find out next week. But yeah. So then, yeah, the cowbell was for your pet. So yeah, Nanami sitting here looking like she's always been to an agricultural school. What are you talking about? And then she's like, oh yeah, my cow is called Nanami. I don't know how to feel about that. But she's like, her name, I guess Nanami is a pretty popular name. And then she ordered the cowbell for her. And she's like, and I ordered a nose ring. And then, of course, we don't get to see it. But the assumption is that Nanami also has the nose ring as well. Mm-hmm. So then the last few lines of the song is a shame. What a shame you don't have wings. If you did, you could go home and graze peacefully. Hmm. And then that's the end. I, <laughs> I, I don't mind Nanami episodes at all because sometimes you need a little bit of a break from the mind melt and to set up the really crazy episodes that are to come. So I'm not going to complain about it. But what a weird episode. It reminded me of that Spongebob episode where Spongebob and the others become snails like Gary. Like anytime there's like a teen wolf, like werewolf transformation episode, it's just like, oh, okay. It was just, I never would have imagined in a thousand years for Utena to have an episode like this. I was not anticipating us going that route. But I guess maybe... Every time something like this happens, I felt this way with Neon Genesis Evangelion as well. Whenever you'd have a bonkers episode like this, to me, it was like the animators and the director were saying, okay, we're about to go into crazy town. If you can handle this, you can handle what we're about to give you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So maybe that's, maybe that's the reasoning. Maybe that's the reasoning behind it. Who knows? But <laughs> anyway... So I'm super excited um, to hear your thoughts down below about this episode. I am so ready for the comments section for this one. I really, really am. I'm sure you all will talk about some metaphors and things talked about it as well that I missed, but we'll just have to wait and see. So anyway, I hope you all have a wonderful week. <laughs> Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back real soon with more of Revolutionary Girl Utena. <laughs> Bye.